Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this uh, March 1st, you know, the very beginning of a hopefully beautiful spring. Um, my name is Cassandra Francis. I am the founder and CEO of One Piece Therapy, as well as one of the practitioners at the practice. Um, for those of you that are familiar with our videos, thank you so much for coming back and joining us today. And those that are new, uh, welcome. Uh, today, as you see, we will be presenting on the creative considerations on our stories um, by Rachel, uh, which is one of our interns at the practice. Um, if you do have any questions, comments, thoughts, uh, please do use the chat uh, to communicate with us. We do love and appreciate uh, interactive presentations. Um, and those that are watching the recorded version, if you do have any questions, thoughts, comments, all the above, please use the comment section below um, and keep in touch. Okay, I'll hand it over to you, Rachel. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I titled this seminar, as Cassandra said, Creative Considerations on Our Story. Um, this presentation is about considering what's underneath the things we tell ourselves. As we define our identities, we also define our habits, our self-talk, and the barriers when growing up, we may remember feeling small when a classmate, classmate said something about how we look or how we speak. That fraction of time can grow to mean more, much more when it becomes a part of how we see ourselves and how we identify ourselves, influencing a patterned self-appraisal. Our stories cannot be so easily distinguished to be good or bad, but multi-layered, highlighting the power of angles and perspectives and the need for more than just one perspective. Okay, so before we dive deeper, I wanted to take a moment to describe the table of contents of this talk. After a brief introduction, we will uh, take a wide framed lens to conceptually understand the value and meaning of story. Then we will take a closer look on pro problem saturated stories that can influence how we talk to ourselves. Then, considering the power of interaction, we will consider how the external and internal react and color the stories that cultivate our dominant stories or narratives. Then considering the weight or thickness of stories, we will reflect on the value of problem stories and consider a road to alternative, adaptive self-understanding. Lastly, we will touch on the road to self-definition in a multidimensional, authentic, and holistic way. Okay, so first I just want to say a little bit about me. I'm a registered psychotherapist qualifying and intern therapist with One Piece. I support clients who cope with anxiety, depression, life transition, stress, and social, cultural identity considerations as well. Typically, I support clients in an integrative way, engaging um, with modalities like CBT and narrative, but with existential and uh, creative and holistic aspects as well. Relating to the One Piece mission, I hope to work with clients to foster self-care, self-authenticity, and resiliency. So story, considering the textures, layers, and dimensions of experience highlights the value of considering the stories that define us. We may find ourselves living by a story that colors our path forward. And I want to give you an example. Um, it's, I coined it the basketball example. <laughs> so imagine two friends playing basketball on the court. There's a winner and a loser. But this is not defining of each participant, as it's locked into the particular game or day itself. One player may have been distracted because they got into an argument with their brother. 
the other may play better because they just received a high score on a test. One's character and other players play a role in our defining moment. There's more to just the court, more than just one basketball game, there's several. There's more than one side to the same event or game and one experience holds multiple dimensions and influencing factors like societal, social, and contextual. A common example is looking at the movies that are popular right now. Um, so for example, we are very familiar with fairy tales like Sleeping Beauty and, and uh, maybe like Marvel or DC <laughs> movies like Batman. But now we're also getting a, a glimpse into the villain side. So looking at Maleficent and the Joker, each highlights the history of either the hero or the villain. Coloring the pages of stories, projecting that black and white, or all or none thinking when we think about these popular stories. We're getting both sides, highlighting that stories are multidimensional and there's a growth to one's dominant story. And can I just add something really quick, Rachel? Because I, I do find it so interesting nowadays too that more people are understanding how villains can become villains um, and how much validity is in their stories, right? Like we often, again, we want to side with the hero and who's against it, it's bad, don't want to be that person, but truly with multiple sides to a story, all are valid in its in its own right, right? I'm even thinking about um, the recent movie I watched, uh, Wakanda. Uh, mm -hmm. Wakanda Forever was the most uh, newest one, but the first one, um, oh no, I'm blanking on on his name. Um, but Michael B. Jordan, <laughs> his, <laughs> you know his 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 perspective was so valid, even though he was painted as the villain. Right. Um, so really, again, just highlighting multiple sides and how much truth there is. In, yeah. In all. yeah, exactly. I think that level of truth is it's, it's so important to consider because we're looking at one character and seeing their whole story, how they interact with their world. But if we're given two stories for the same event, we realize that both sides are multidimensional. And the character is a lot more layered and textured than maybe previously uh, we were led to believe. Yeah. Okay. So according to White and Epstein, uh, the founders of narrative <laughs> therapy, our interpretation defines our perspective and in turn builds our self story. Um, I, I wanted to provide a fairy tale example as a Disney fan. Um, in Frozen, for example, the main character, Elsa, is afraid of showing who she is. And the story of fear or self-dislike limits her connection to herself and also disconnects her from her loved ones. The unveiling of personal power, um, in her case, literal uh, snow magic, um, it, it highlights as a tool, a tool to see all of herself and divine, define and take ownership of her story in a way she, in a way that she's moving forward with all parts of herself. So not just the fear, but also the sense of personal power. To break down this idea a little bit more, I have a question to ask all of you. So, um, ask yourself, what is my story? And more importantly, what do I tell myself? What do I tell myself is my story? Is there a label uh, that stops you from going after something uh, you really want or feel connected to? Is there a word or a name someone calls you in the past that takes up space in your mind? The stories we tell ourselves are influenced by our surroundings and how we interpret them. Sometimes these stories can be self-restrictive and, and a form of self-punishment. I think there there's so much to say here because even talking about, you know, what is my story, in what context is the question being asked, 
right? Is it my general life story from childhood to adulthood? Is it the story of uh, career, right? The story of love, um, the story of now, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like what, what, I'm not even asking you, but I'm just thinking out loud in terms of like what parts of our story are we including in our story? I think that's so important. That's such an important question because yes. when we're defining our story, it can be pretty challenging to see um, aspects outside of the dominant story that we've been telling ourselves. So if we're talking about career, for example, sometimes it can become the dominant story, neglecting other aspects of our life and how we identify ourselves. Right. So the question is more about what's been dominant in your life, what feels mm -hmm. restrictive, and what feels like is narrowing your your potential to have multi-stories. Because mm -hmm. even that question has has multiple answers. Yeah, that's right. It's the amazing. dominant story doesn't necessarily mean it's the restrictive story but it could be if that's the one leading where we we try to aim for balance <laughs> in our <laughs> life so if something is too dominating you know it implies some restriction but um yeah this question is is so deep so i just wanted to really highlight how how deep it goes and how needed this reflection is because it really does shape how we understand our, and navigate our world yeah, I think so. It's 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 almost like when we're opening up a book and there's a lot of assumptions on the first page mm -hmm. and we're stopping ourselves in that point, but this is an invitation to look a little bit deeper. Yes. Don't judge a book by its cover, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, these statements on this slide are phrases to highlight how an ownership of a problem can enable a disconnection to self. I'm just going to read some of these out. Um, all right. So the first one is, I am the problem. This is my problem. I always blank. So this is an example of how uh, when we over-identify with a problem, the language here is uh, I. Like there's a connection to the problem instead of uh, a permission to look around the problem. And then some other examples are my stress, sadness, I'm not worthy enough because I am bad at uh, dot, dot, dot. I'm a loser. These, these uh, examples highlight that with the language of my and I, we're putting more emphasis on the problem and the problem's effect on ourselves. So it's almost like the problem feels greater than who we are. Um, so in other words, the ownership encourages a self-limiting narrative to form because the problem feels like it has the power and the self feels like it's almost like the, the smaller aspect in relationship to the problem. Okay, so sorry, sorry, anyway. Rachel. So, do you mind going back to the slide? Sure. Um, I am curious in in the in the theme of reframing, right? How would you reframe some of these statements for a client that repeatedly states, "Say, I am the problem. This is my problem. I am a loser." Just a couple of examples about how to reframe those statements. I think the first step is kind of understanding when these uh, these points of language come up for you. So especially in your thoughts, are you are you hearing this statement of I and my? Uh, maybe not statement. The um, the uh, the ownership of how the language is is laid out in terms of that problem. So first would be recognizing when that's happening and what it's relating to. Or what is the problem and how much of a relationship you have with it and engaging with the level of distance and perspective to then kind of question is this my problem or is this a problem I am facing right yeah 
Right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I was going to say, like, even thinking about someone outside of therapy, like that is, is such a big intellectual task to do by yourself. Um, because truly when we're, when we're in the thick of things, how, how can we look outside of it when it's our experience that we're identifying with? Um, and I did just want to highlight how deep it really goes, which is what I hear you say, like it, it goes deep. You do have to take a, a outsider's perspective. And when that mm -hmm. is hard or more challenging, um, do seek support to gain an outsider perspective. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it, it's interesting in the way you highlighted it with um, outside perspective. So it's almost like standing in a space of objectivity, just temporarily. Temporarily. Yeah, to see the, the power and the influence that the problem may have in the way you see yourself and the way you interact with other people. Yes, yes, that's a, a great highlight too, is, is temporarily, <laughs> right? Because if we're too separate, then that's a whole other concern to deal with, um, but momentarily to understand things, yes. Um, yeah. Thank you, Rachel. No problem. Um, there will be examples about reframing soon. Okay, so yeah, so the problem feels greater than self. That's when there's a problem saturated story at play. Um, and the mission here is to challenge that. And it, it does sound more difficult than um, other elements to consider because something that defines us can feel like it's hard to escape from. So the dominant story, according to Delwick Center and Morgan's uh, writings on narrative therapy, is that the central story is, is one that defines one's past and influences present day actions and also kind of perpetuates that kind of thinking into future decisions. When dominant stories are fueled in self-limiting beliefs or problem saturated language like the my and the I, um, the, the story feels like it's influencing not only the way that you see yourself, but also the way you interact and connect to your own future. So identifying significant moments in your past, like points on a map, can allow you to highlight for yourself what's been almost like the fuel to, to see yourself in a problem-saturated way. So the Dulwick Center provides an example with driving. I, I think this is a pretty good example because, um, for example, if if you know someone that just experienced an accident where the fault was external, the actor adopts that dominant story that they're a bad driver. So there's that sense of ownership that one event can feel like it's self-defining. So there's thoughts of like, I'm a bad driver. I'm a terrible driver. I can't follow the rules, that kind of thing. And then there's feelings of, that come up as well, like inadequacy regarding driving, and there's a fear associated with it. And the behavior that comes up is avoidance or even hypervigilance uh, with the wheel and driving. So in that instance, the past experience kind of infiltrates the way that that actor is uh, connecting to their present and the future, where that dominant story of being a bad driver can be pinpointed on the, like a one dimensional line where you can see the event and how it ripples into their present and future choices. Almost like living with a horse blinder, uh, on your, on your, on your view of your life and your past where instances feel like they're self defining because there's no, um, consideration of alternative or other day perspective. So how do we challenge that? How do we challenge that singular momentum of one dominant story that feels like it's restrictive? So one way is by asking questions to kind of take out those horse spiders and widen the view. So for example, relating to the driving, 
is what if we ask the driver and the actor questions to pinpoint moments disproving that dominant story? So like on a day-to-day -day basis, would you say that you follow the driving rules and the signs? On a day-to-day -day basis, do you find that you're responsible and alert? So when there's an overpowering, self-limiting story, the problem feels greater than the self. Where one is restricted and disconnected to their core sense of meaning. So when we're talking about the driving aspect, by asking questions that open up their frame of reference, we're no longer being defined by one instant, one story, one self-limiting belief. We're opening it up to other experiences that sometimes challenge uh, the problem that feels self-defined. Okay, so here's another example, and it kind of goes with that idea of asking yourself questions. Um, to kind of open up again, taking out the horse blinders and allowing a wider lens view of your story, uh, specifically limiting and restrictive stories. I'm just going to read this example. Um, so the example is, I'm a, I am bad at school. I am not good enough. So that that dominant story is. One that's problem saturated. Again, with the I um, and not good enough, it's almost like the problem feels greater than the self. So what we're trying to do is deconstruct and go more to the root of what's underneath those words. So deconstruction is essentially asking questions, questions to go deeper into what's bringing up this self-restrictive story that has become dominant. So we ask questions to see how the story influences other aspects of experience, like the way we think, the way we feel, uh, what's happening in the body, so essentially thoughts, emotions, feelings, and how that story kind of infiltrates the past and the present and the future. So taking this example of uh, being a bad student, essentially deconstruction is looking at each element, going to the cause and finding how the root branches out in other aspects or influences. So some of those questions would be, where did this thought come from? Who does that voice sound like or look like? Uh, what are the feelings happening emotionally, physically? And what systems or contexts are at play here? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so for someone wanting to guide themselves through this deconstructing process, a um, couple questions maybe is how, how would they know that they got to the root of their concern? Um, but also is there like a, a strict systematic way of getting to the root of the concern as well. Like, does it have to be four or five questions? No, no, not necessarily. I think a kind of a rule of thumb is almost like exact acting, asking yourself like a W5H of what's going on. So what, who, when, where, it's, it's just trying to define what the story is and where it has basis and maybe where it doesn't have basis. Okay. And so how, how would they know? Like, so they, they ask themselves all these questions, maybe some come with, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, how would they know it's been deconstructed? Well, I guess you could think of deconstructing as the tool of getting into what is underneath the word, underneath that problem saturated language. But it's not, it's not even about like the exact number of questions. It's about when you kind of uh, gain a sense of awareness of the power of the story and the role that you play in relationship to the story. Okay. 
So I think I think it's fair to say um, that the deconstructing process is a process mm-hmm. and not necessarily a destination. Yeah, that's, that's a great um, <laughs> metaphor <laughs> in the making. So yeah, exactly. So it's more about building and practicing that sense of awareness and reflection of how a problem is not uh, one dimensional. We're looking to see if it's influencing multiple parts. All right, so it kind of relates to how we talk to ourselves. So another word for that is self-talk. It's how we communicate with ourselves. And thoughts and stories kind of have a similar platform because they're based in how we see ourselves, how we talk to ourselves. So it's almost cyclical in a way when thoughts are problem saturated, stories are problem saturated. Thoughts, in other words, uh, impact self-talk and self-talk when flooded in uh, the focus of a problem uh, becomes a space of criticism and punishment. And it can make it feel like we lose the power over our mind, our stories. However, these thoughts are not always um, connected to the individual by themselves. Can be also connected to those interactions that we hold as self-defining. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the interaction piece in the next slide. So the power of interactions talks about um, how our external and our internal are not um, separate parts. It's almost like they are meshed in the way that they relate to each other. So it's it's kind of like that expression, messy mind, messy room. It's it's kind of like we we see what's going on in here, but we also have interactions with other people that may also impact how we think. So it's very cyclical and relational. Um, So the external world relates not only to the interaction itself, but also other elements like cultural, societal pressures from family, pressures from community. So it's it's more complex than just uh, a two-way conversation. There's multiple aspects at play here. So an example might be internalizing a critical parent voice where those interactions uh, might have not been singular. It might have been uh, meshed in many experiences growing up, but now it's transformed into a self-critical voice in one's mind, which causes um, actions of maybe people pleasing or indecision. So it kind of highlights how Yes, we do have the power of our stories, but they're also uh, related to interactions that color our external world and how the external and internal relate to one another. Okay. So internalizing interaction can cause problem saturated stories to form and define our past as well as how we interact with our future. So I wanted to provide this very popularized quote by Michael White. Um, So the person is not the problem, the problem is the problem. So this is harder to practice than (laughs) how like eloquently it's phrased. Um, So in, in concert with that, it's highlighting how the problem is not defining who we are. It's more about being an element of our experience where the self is still the self and the problem is the problem. So we're again creating that distance um, to allow us to reframe and uh, redefine how the problem influences our daily actions and our future actions. Yes, and I just hinting on this quote too, um, what I love about the scope of psychotherapy is how typically it is very non-pathological right Mm -hmm. it's it's really 
already separating the client from the concerns they're bringing and, and looking at it as a, a human experience, um, as a life experience that challenges people in different ways, right? Because again, with our story um, and our identity, what our body responds to shows what is significant to us, right? And not that it, it is you're the problem or not, but this is something significant to you. Therefore, it has impacted you. Therefore, that is what needs to be worked through, right? Versus again, this traumatic, for example, incident happened, you are trauma, you have trauma, you know, like mm -hmm. that, um, like what you're saying, it can, it can feel enmeshed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But already just, being in psychotherapy and just our, our scope and our understanding of human experiences, it's, it is truly imp like, it's so crucial to identify the problem as the problem um, and not the person being the problem. Yeah, I so agree <laughs> with that idea because it sounds, it can feel like the problem becomes life. And what we're trying to do is trying to create that distance but also uh, a way back to reconnect to ourselves rather than allow the power to continue to feather into other aspects of experience um, okay so but how do we defeat or combat the problem story it starts with considering and challenging the problem so Okay, so uh, narrative therapy kind of breaks it down into two. So there's two types of stories. One that is thinner, where the problem-saturated story kind of fits into this block, where it feels um, unidimensional. So it's very like cause and effect. I'm this because of that has happened to me. So it's, it feels very linear. There's not much... Uh, room for contradiction. It's not as multi-layered as defining stories usually are. So a thick story in reverse is something that feels more intrinsic. It has multi-layers. It's grounded in multiple aspects. It feels more whole. So when considering thick stories, the develop the, the development is nuanced, balanced with challenges and triumphs. And it, it fosters more of an adaptive lens where the weight of the problem is, again, it's not, as we, as you said, it, it's more, it's not enmeshed with one's experience. It's, there's a little bit of distance from that problem and that problem's control. Okay, so reconnecting to the self doesn't mean rewriting one story it it doesn't mean we're neglecting the weight of the problem but we're just allowing space to consider other elements that influence or live parts of the self and are kind of like surrounding the problem so we're, we're trying to gain distance by looking at how aspects are multi-layered so it's kind of like considering moments from a wider lens, requiring space of non-judgment where the self is considered on an objective space. So looking at both the hardship and the dark moments and the light and the hope moments as well. So rewriting, in other words, is actually reconnecting to a whole version of you, not subjected into like hyper positivity or or problems in a singular or restrictive way, but it's connecting to a more adaptive self-appraisal that feels more balanced. Yeah, oh. I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I went back. <laughs> um, yes, I, I, this is so important. This is so important to acknowledge that, you know, it is connecting to the truth, right? And again, when we're in the thick of things, we can only see maybe one aspect of the truth and not the whole story. Um, and the whole story has so much more information to give, right? It's, it's, it's also comforting, especially because I'm thinking of clients that I, I've seen or currently support, 
where they really identify with their story. Like they're attached to it. They don't want to let it go. This is all they know. Of course, you can ask the challenging questions of how how is this benefiting you, right? Attaching to something that's no longer serving you. Um, but at the same time, there there is that safety and that understanding and knowing, you know, it's not dismissing parts of your story. It's, it's looking at all parts. So there is this connection to self and truth, mm-hmm. right? Um, and the safety in knowing that it's it's the whole and, and not, you know, um, a, a specific narrowed, rigid part of the story. Yeah, that's so, so good. I think the rigid, Rigidity is something that sometimes we fall into because it feels, in a, in a way, it does feel like it's safe because it, it's like right. we know the parts. <laughs> right. we, we know the line of control. Um, but when we're trying to open it up, there is a little bit of vulnerability there. Absolutely. And we're trying to support that piece by fostering the sense of uh, I guess self-compassion and just looking into how our stories are not just one-dimensional, it's multi-dimensional yes. and engaging with more than what feels like it's taking our control. Right. Yes. The, the journey to understanding self, mm. right? Um, <laughs> literally the therapeutic process is the journey to, to understanding self. Um, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to provide a bit of a um, some some connection to this research paper. Uh, it's by Fletcher and his team, and essentially it's breaking down the dominant narrative into three parts. And this kind of borrows from the CBT idea of um, thoughts and emotions and thematic considerations, but in, in a narrative kind of way. So we're engaging with how these elements bring about a dominant story that can be self-defining instead of self-restrictive. It's almost like each element is going into a sense of congruence. So uh, sometimes it can feel like the cognitive is opposing the emotion or what we feel inside is is kind of uh, going against what we're thinking. So we're just, in a way, when we're trying to build a dominant uh, and self-reflective narrative instead of a self-restrictive one, we're trying to find this holistic sense of congruency between these parts. So for the statement or thought, I'm bad at school, I'm not good enough, considering an alternative thought, like the program is challenging and I'm trying my best, can forge an action-oriented path to re-engage with the thoughts, emotions, and somatic consideration in a in a way that feels more unified, where it feels more aligned. So when we have more alignment, we're able to go forward in a more action-oriented way, where we may ask ourselves instead, how can I support myself during this tough time? Who could I reach out to? Um, So the dominant narrative that felt restrictive now feels like it's transforming from something that feels problem saturated and and, um, kind of separated between cognitive emotion and somatic into something that feels more solution focused or adaptive, where that phrase, I'm bad at school, turns into something like I'm resilient, I'm a resilient student in a challenging program. So essentially, when we're looking at these pieces, we're engaging with them in a congruency fashion instead of a detachment of defining them separately. Okay, so this piece of identity is kind of going back to that idea of multiple elements, where... Stories are constructed in multi-dimensional ways. Um, according to Coombs and Friedemann, uh, defining self comes from considering our strengths, our culture, values, 
moments that tested us, moments that gave us meaning and a sense of purpose. So considering our stories can feel like we're focusing on one element, but we're instead we're trying to gain a perspective in the relational aspect of our experience. So how it uh, interacts with um, what we connect to, what drives us, what feels like it fills our cup, essentially. So it's, it's kind of like our stories not only rely on our uh, restrictive moments, it also considers our personal choice, our choices, triumphs, challenges, mistakes, as well as interactions, societal considerations, biases, and relationships to various communities. So when considering your story, what comes to mind? What interactions or choices mark your pages? Oh, I was, yeah, <laughs> I was about to say something. Um, you know, the, there's, yeah, there's so much pieces to the identity, right? And even on the, the front of culture, right? Even that has so much different perspectives to it. Um, if it's the Canadian culture, if you're born in Canada or even migrated to Canada, maybe you feel more aligned with the culture here, or if you're from somewhere else, um, and even depending on where you're from in the world, it has its own culture. Um, th there's, yeah, there's so much pieces to that word in itself of culture and, and where you identify with, um, how you identify. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, like, even with each point, there's still there's just yeah. so much depth to understanding um, truly what, what you feel is, is part of your truth. Yeah, I think that's, it goes so well, or like hand in hand, with the idea of, of multi-story story, <laughs> because each piece is in itself its own range or um, multiplicity of various experiences and we're kind of trying to find um, as we're we're defining ourselves it's more about finding our own version our own connection to to culture to values etc it's it's defining um, your your version of what connects to you and what drives you um, so I guess the follow-up to that is <laughs> who am I uh, who do I want to be? These are really big questions. And I think it's important to highlight that when we're asking these questions, you can feel like we, we have uh, a lack of power, or the lack of parchment to write our story. <laughs> so I guess this is a reminder that you are the writer, uh, the definer of your story. Sometimes the influences of external factors or interactions can make it seem like we don't hold authorship or authorship of our story and how they move forward. So if we were to consider today, for example, as the start of a new chapter or the beginning of a new page, where you hold the pen may help you make your mark forward. Rosen and colleague study discussed how societal narratives can influence one's development or attachment to their personal identity. Defining our uh, defining one's story when it feels like outside forces are ripping out pages <laughs> can make uh, the problem saturated uh, stories feel like they have the power, they have the, the pen. So for example, when you feel caught between friends versus family or community versus dominant mainstream culture, or the want of something versus the need to do something. Uh, these, I guess, contradictions or conflicts can feel all encompassing. So it feels like we have to choose one side and that can cause internalized conflict to surface and self-restricting stories to develop 
And as highlighted by Rosen and company and Coombs and Friedman, engaging in the fluidity of choice and the aspect of multi uh, storied uh, levels highlights the freedom in finding your own medium relating to values, culture, and uh, other aspects of identity. Uh, so there, by considering what you connect to or what you value, helps engage in a self-connected movement forward and disengagement from self-restriction or feeling stuck in uh, having to choose all or nothing or black or white and allowing that gray space to to take uh, a sense of personal ownership or allowance of personal ownership. Okay. Oh gosh. All right. So this this slide is kind of relating to that um, reflective piece of making uh, or turning the new page and making uh, meaningful momentum forward. Uh, so defining self without limitations is a challenging, very challenging task, as we are attempting to challenge patterns of behaviors and self-limiting beliefs and engage in something that may have been forgotten or silenced because of uh, interactions or experiences. And I think I will leave with this journal or writing exercise as we've been talking about narratives and stories. <laughs> um, how, this question is, how could I make a meaningful momentum forward if there was no uh, restrictive or barriers in my, in my story? All right, so these are some references, and thank you very much for listening. And if we have any questions, yeah, definitely. Thank you for that, Rachel. I I, I do want to go back to your your last question and just okay. just spend some time there. Do you mind asking it again? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, how could I make uh, meaningful momentum forward if there was no uh, restrictive beliefs, no barriers, that kind of thing. Yeah. And quite quite immediately, I already have different perspectives, not even personally. Um, well, actually, okay, let's just lose, use myself as an example. Um, that question still brings up different parts. Right. It's like, OK, where we. I could be. Optimistic. When like, OK, there's no restrictions like freedom, you know, let's see what's there. Let's be curious. Let's explore. Let's develop and create, you know, all the nice words <laughs> to, to build <laughs> and feel light. Um, but in the same breath, you know, also thinking about without restrictions, it's like, oh, you know, there, there could be fear, there could be chaos, there could be mess, um, mm -hmm. definitely uncertainty, because now that there's no restrictions. Um, and although they're, they're separate feelings, they can definitely coexist, right? Like you, you could still be fearful of something and courageous. Mm. Right? And and that that courage really would and really can help define and shape and bring that depth to the understanding of the narrative, my narrative in this example. Um, but yeah, I'm just, again, just thinking out loud of giving that question to the audience and, and what truly can come up from it, because it's it's new territory, right? We're saying, okay, let's separate for something that you could have possibly been attached to for X amount of years, depending on how old you are. Um, or maybe if it's even one year, I mean, so much things can solidify within that time, but I think I'm rambling, but there's just so much pieces to that. <laughs> it's like, wow, that, that is really a big question. Um, that I wanted to just revisit and give space to because it's it's something to reflect on for sure. Yeah, I think it is a really 
big question and I guess to make it more approachable and and a little bit more uh, tangible is (laughs) is to to see it in two parts kind of like what you were saying like to recognize what has been holding uh, me back or the barriers that have been influencing my choices as of late and then the second one would be like um, if I were able to manage or kind of gain distance from these barriers or these beliefs, what then is my potential or forward momentum looking like? Okay. Thank you so much, Rachel. It was great to, to hear your perspective as always and, and learn more about narratives, but also narrative therapy. Um, Again, for the audience, if you do have any more comments, any questions, uh, please feel free to send us an email, give us a call. Uh, Rachel is accepting new clients, so also feel free to continue the conversation with her um, and and learn more and understanding (laughs) yourself and perspective. Um, Again, for those watching the recorded version, please feel free to leave us some comments, questions, and and we'll be sure to address them. Thank you for joining. Thank you.